Um, hi everybody, uh, my name is Abe, uh, and I recently released a uh, Python package called HighScore, and I'm going to talk to you about that uh, tonight. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to thank Thumbtack for hosting. Uh, can't say enough good things about Thumbtack. Uh, there we go. Um, really great, exciting company, and I know they're hiring data scientists and machine learning people, so if you're interested, uh, yeah, you should definitely uh, shoot them off an application because they are great and they are totally killing it. So good work, Thumbtack. Um, so uh, I think it's important to, when I get started here to discuss what I actually mean by scores. Um, it's kind of a loaded term with lots of definitions, and so the scores I'm talking about that you can make with high score are like a uh, walk score, recently acquired by Redfin, um, that allows you to input an address and it'll tell you how walkable uh, your neighborhood is. Or clout, recently acquired by Lithium. Uh, clout take social media profiles and maps them somewhat nonsensically to scores between one and 100. Uh, Barack Obama gets a 99, <laughs> sure. Uh, but it's not just recently acquired startups that can use scores. Uh, the NFL has the quarterback passer rating. Uh, that's a nice plot there. Uh, and then MITRE has the common weakness scoring system, uh, which is used to assess uh, software vulnerabilities. So scores come up a lot, and HighScore is a Python package that can help you make and maintain scoring functions. And there are two real advances here, and one is kind of on the philosophical side, and the second is on the algorithmic side. So I'm going to talk uh, about both of those advances uh, here. And so the philosophical side is uh, called supervised scoring, which is a new way of actually just thinking about how you construct a score. So let's like zoom out if we're going to start talking about philosophy. So like what are scores? Like how would you describe what is happening when you score something? Um, and the best definition I've come up with is that scores are a tool for domain experts to communicate their expertise to a broad audience. So. You're taking a complex notion that may be largely unintelligible to a layperson, and you're saying, look, I'm the expert. I can tell you that this weird kind of beigey orange blob on the left is an 88, whereas that kind of weird greenish blob on the right is only a 27. So to lay people, it's kind of mysterious as to why the scores are that way, but the expert can use their discretion to uh, come up with reasonable scores that can communicate their expertise to a broad audience. Uh, another way of looking at it that maybe is a more machine learning centric way is as a dimensionality reduction. So what we're talking about here is we're taking a set of numeric attributes along dimensions and we're going to compress them using a scoring function into a single numeric value. So we have like, this is a five dimensional example and then gets compressed into a 58 score. So you might wonder like, okay, those just seem like arbitrary values. Who came up with those? And, and in fact, I think that you are entirely correct to say that. Um, maybe somewhat controversially, I don't believe that there's any such thing as a correct scoring function. So if we use the example of walk score, there's no reason you couldn't create a walk score where every single address got 100. And you can also create a walk score where every single address gets a zero. Um, those are totally valid scores. Um, but nobody would use your system. So in my view, kind of, it's only the public recognition by acclamation that you, the domain expert, are properly scoring something that allows scores to be accepted. Um, and as kind of evidence of this theory, um, ESPN has released a competing rating metric to score quarterbacks that has been less well received than the NFL scoring metric. So they both purport to score you know, the, this position in football, but people accept the NFL score more than ESPN score. So it, there's no one right score or one way to do things. There's no correct way to score something. It's uh, does the public accept the expertise that went into creating that score? So OK, say you sat down today and you wanted to make a scoring function. How would you do it? Uh, right now, you would use the dual approach. And so I'm going to use some terminology from like linear programming or optimization. So in the dual approach, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to start by selecting a set of basis functions. That's these phi i's. 
Uh, so let's say we were rebuilding walk score. Well, we might want some kind of uh, radial drop-off function that is the distance away from a school or the distance away from a grocery store. Um, so we're going to come up with these functions. The expert's just going to think these up. Um, and then the expert's going to twiddle with the coefficients associated with these functions until things look more or less correct. Uh, so we have a set of coefficients that we twiddle and the set of basis functions that the expert kind of comes up with. So the problem with dual scores uh, is that they ossify. So you quickly, they're very quick to develop, but then you also get in a state where uh, if you try to fix a mistake, you end up creating more mistakes than you fix, which means that you just end up not, you just stop touching the score entirely. Uh, so I'm gonna rag on walk score a little bit, which is totally unfair. Um, their CTO actually responded to a cold email I sent him, and like I went up to Seattle and met with them and like learned all about scoring and their system and how it worked, and they're really great guys, but uh, he would actually be the first to admit that uh, their scoring system is not fantastic. So for instance, this is a market in 6th Street, which everyone who lives in the city would be familiar with, um, and walk score identifies this as a walker's paradise, which <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, so what's happening here? Well, I actually literally brought up this example to the walk score CTO, and he's like, yeah, we don't, like, why doesn't crime play a role in the score? And he said, well, we don't really mess with it anymore because we found out when we start messing with it, it breaks other stuff, so it just kind of is what it is. Um, so that's, like, not a great solution, and uh, when I was thinking about scoring systems, that answer really inspired me to create something that could actually get better over time uh, as opposed to just kind of doing this. So uh, I came up with supervised scoring, which uh, is a, in contrast to the dual approach, uh, from the optimization side can be considered a primal approach. Because instead of dealing with these kind of dual basis functions, you deal directly with uh, objects and their scores. So in supervised scoring, you start by labeling a reference set uh, of you know, kind of candidate values. So you say, I think this thing should get a 50 and this thing should get a 65. Uh, and the dimensions uh, of the objects themselves. You say, this is a good attribute, this is a bad attribute, this is a good attribute. Uh, and then an algorithm makes a scoring function that interpolates your, through your reference set and also obeys your monotone relationship. So there are some really good features of the supervised scoring system that you don't see uh, with the dual approach. So the first one is this guarantee of monotonicity the way you'd expect it to do. And, and this goes back to my larger philosophy about scoring functions, that if the only reason your scoring function is credible is that people believe the score is coming out of it, you don't want a system where increasing a bad attribute uh, makes the scores go up, which can and will happen if your scores don't have a guarantee of monotonicity. Um, so this goes back to the idea that it's up to uh, people to accept and understand the score that the expert is imposing on them. And if the expert knows that you know, certain, ad certain dimensions are bad and other dimensions are good, like crime is bad and distance to a school is, well, I guess it would also be bad because it would be a decreasing score in distance. Um, if that's not reflected in the scoring function that the expert's creating, uh, people won't believe the scores and it won't get traction. Uh, the second and more important feature, I think, of supervised scoring is that it's very, very easy to improve the score. Uh, so imagine that you have seen a misscored point, like sixth and market gets an 100. Um, you can add it to the reference set with a correct score, say a 50, uh, and then just rerun the algorithm. Uh, and then you're guaranteed, first off, that because the algorithm interpolates that sixth and market will get a score of 50, but you're also guaranteed that every other member in the reference set will have exactly the same score uh, as when you started with it. So um, just to go back to kind of a LP optimization idea, this is kind of like a, like a row generation idea. So we keep adding, or um, maybe for a software engineering perspective, this is kind of like regression testing, right? Um, we find things that break, and then we throw them into the unit testing framework, and then we can be sure that they'll never break again, right? Other stuff can break, and we'll invent new tests to uh, make those things not break as well. But the, the nice thing is that we can be assured that we will never see a failure on something that, has, that we've seen a failure on in the past once we fix it. So it's these uh, two features, the, the monotonicity, which can help with acceptance, 
and then this um, row generation or regression testing property of the reference set uh, that really makes uh, scores that will, like there's a very easy path for them to get better over time, but they certainly won't get worse over time. Okay, uh, so I swept something under the rug, which was uh, the word algorithm that does all this magic. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a scene in The Matrix uh, where uh, uh, Morpheus talks to Neo, and he's explaining the nature of the real world out there in the cornfields where people are hooked up to these bats. And, and he just has this like real throwaway line that says like, you know, combined with a source of fusion, the machines had all the power they'd ever need. And that's just kind of like totally just not even discussed for the rest of the film. Um, and my impression was like, what's the source of fusion? Like, what, are we gonna hear about that? Or like, that seems like, why do they need the human brains? Um, and similarly, like, I have just totally skipped over this part about the algorithm that does all this magic, uh, which is really the fundamental part. Um, so, okay, let's talk about developing the algorithm. So one of the very interesting research features of this problem is that I have never encountered a problem that is so easy in a single dimension and so freaking difficult in multiple dimensions. So how easy is it in one dimension? Well, it's really easy. So here's a set of monotone increasing points, and I want to invent an algorithm uh, that interpolates and obeys monotonicity. So I can just do piecewise linear. That works. Uh, I could also do something fancier, like splines. Cool. Uh, pretty much any like line that you draw that goes up and to the right and hits all those points, as long as your algorithm does that, it will be fine in one dimension. So that's really great. You're like, oh, this is like an easy problem, like no, no issue. Uh, and then it turns out to be hard in many dimensions. I don't really have a formal proof. I mean, there's some like maybe and be hardness stuff you could think about in here, but it's hard from the sense of like, I tried a bunch of different approaches to get this work, and, and uh, none of them worked for a very, very long time. And uh, since I have the time tonight, uh, I'll just introduce some of those failed approaches, because I think, in general, people have a tendency to talk about the stuff that's successful, and they never really talk about the stuff that didn't work. So I'm gonna talk about some stuff that didn't work, that are maybe clever ideas, but failed. Uh, so the first, and maybe most obvious one, is uh, simplical interpolation, which is can just be thought of as a um, kind of multi-dimensional piecewise linear uh, routine. And in fact, there's like, uh, I think it's a SciPy library that just does this for you. You just hand it a bunch of points and you say, interpolate these and it will give you a function. Uh, unfortunately, that function is not monotone. Uh, this is my demonstration example here. So I have four labeled points in two dimensions, um, the 100, 95, 95, and then five. Um, so the monotone relationship I want is that when I move to the south or to the west, the score should go up. Um, and for the left-hand interpolating triangle, it doesn't have that because as I move um, to the west uh, across that triangle, the point that's labeled five gets more weight and the point that's labeled 95 gets less weight, so the score goes down. Um, and there is not a really easy or elegant way to fix this idea. Okay, so maybe we can try some other stuff. Uh, Here's uh, an approach that doesn't actually really work, but I still got a paper out of it. Uh, B-spline product bases, uh, as featured in AAAI 2014, uh, produce these really beautiful um, scoring functions that can interpolate through things. Um, unfortunately, uh, they don't really scale to more than two dimensions, uh, and they don't scale more than two dimensions because of the cursive dimensionality. So if you're not familiar with the cursive dimensionality, it generally suggests that uh, whatever you have is ex uh, exponentially blows up in the number of dimensions that you're working with. So here's a graphical picture. So like in one dimension, you're like, oh, that's like, that's not hard. I just need to solve for like five coefficients in my program. And it's like two dimensions. Oh, it's like 25. Like nobody did it. It's like three. Uh. So that's like the curse of dimensionality, and it totally trips up this technique. Um, fortunately, the AAA reviewers did not pick up on that. Um, <laughs> so, right. Uh, Another approach that is fairly natural would be radial basis functions, which uh, you may have used in an SVM at some point. Um, so this was a very clever idea that uh, Ken Judd at Stanford came up with very quickly when I started working with him. Uh, his idea was, okay, just use these radial basis functions. There's no guarantee of monotonicity with the radial basis functions, but we can use row generation to check monotonicity. So essentially, we'll solve this problem that makes sure we interpolate, 
then we'll somehow generate cleverly a set of points at which to evaluate monotonicity. If we fail monotonicity, we'll just add those uh, as rows into our program and rerun and keep doing this until we uh, can test a bunch of points and it's all monotone in the direction we want and it works well. Um, so this doesn't work either because it also suffers from the curse of dimensionality. So you know you can think about in four dimensions you have to test you know an, uh, sort of n times more points than you would in three dimensions. So it also suffers from this exponential blow up. Um, and what this kind of failure taught me is that uh, if you want monotonicity in your scoring function, you have to have it guaranteed from first principles. It's not something that you can just kind of build in later, uh, which is what this approach is trying to do. It's a pretty clever approach, but doesn't work. Um, so I tried neural networks, and you know I was getting desperate when I tried neural networks. Um, sorry, I religious thing. Um, okay, so actually, you know, neural networks, uh, unlike most problems, uh, is actually a really natural fit here um, because the uh, essentially, you know, you think about a, a typical response function. Uh, like a logistic function, and, and it's monotone. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, and then as long as our weights of combining these logistic functions are positive, which we can just make, uh, make that happen, uh, then the resulting function and the next layer will also be monotone. Uh, so it's a great way to guarantee monotonicity, and uh, there's a theoretical result that says as long as we have, right, this isn't, so in general, neural networks are kind of universal approximators. Because these are monotone, we need to have a second, like we need to have, uh, two hidden layers instead of just one to get to the output that we need and it should still be universal though and there's proof and in fact there's even a, an R package that does this uh, monotone multi-layer perceptron neural networks uh, mon MLP you can download it and use it uh, it just unfortunately doesn't seem to run in practice um, I gave it a test example and it ran for a really 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 long time and then kind of spit out an answer that wasn't right um, and that just reinforced my just general perception of neural networks. Okay, so um, finally uh, we had success and it came from this obscure paper that, whose title wouldn't suggest that it would be successful. Uh, it was published about 10 years ago in like BIT numerical mathematics and it's called Monotonicity Preserving Approximation of Multivariate Scattered Data. And of course we're not trying to approximate scattered data but whatever, this worked really well. Uh, and it's the, by Gleb Belyakov. So it's, I'm gonna call this the Belyakov technique. Um, I'm gonna describe what it does. And in order to do that, uh, I'm gonna have to do some boring math stuff. So as a reminder, uh, there's this notion that's a strong notion of continuity called Lipschitz continuity. And what it means is that your function values uh, are less than some constant times the difference uh, in where you evaluated that function or graphically, which is the right way, maybe the easiest way to think about it, it means that uh, your function entirely exists within these cones that are projecting, those cones that I drew should go to infinity, but they would like just obscure the screen. So just imagine those cones projecting out to infinity. And if you have it, uh, if your function is Lipschitz continuous, you know that every value will fall within those cones. There will be your function will never go outside those cones. Uh, if you have a monotone function, shape of your cones changes. Uh, in monotone Lipschitz continuity, in, you get these like flat triangle cones instead of those like um, two-sided cones. Uh, because obviously, you know, the function can't go down uh, if it goes to the right, and it can't go up if it goes to the left from that point. Does everyone follow the cone argument? Okay, cool. So uh, what is the Belyakov technique? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get, we assume that it has this Lipschitz uh, uh, parameter, which we can actually solve for given the input data. We're going to project these monotone Lipschitz cones from each point to generate upper and lower bounds. Uh, and then we're going to take the soup, which is the uh, lowest, the smallest upper bound, and the int, the highest lower bound from these bounding cones. So we get a, a range of values that our function needs to be between. And then we just pick the value that's halfway in between those two bounds. And it seems like really simple and, and it actually works. And it works really well, even in a bunch of dimensions. So this is an example from Belyakov's paper. Um, the cones kind of don't look like cones here because he's, he's really um, chopped them off. But you can see that the, uh, as a result, you, know, you, you can see how the cones converge around any point that you've given in the reference set. So that uh, guarantees interpolation. Um, you can just kind of, it's a very like easy mathematical argument to see 
uh, that the soup and inf bounds will themselves be monotone in the direction you want, uh, which means that halfway in between them will be monotone in the way you want, which means your function will be monotone in the way you want. So it's kind of a, frankly, a very elegant um, application of Lipschitz continuity. Uh, and there's only one problem with this in practice, and that's that uh, it's a little bit too aggressive about these function values. So the thing about Lipschitz continuity is that it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's far too loose um, for a number of your points, right? You're saying that, well, okay, what if the function is, you know, maybe in, in, a, in a local area is like relatively, you know, not really, uh, doesn't need this giant Lipschitz uh, constant in order to get all the function values. So a as a result, um, you unfortunately get these plateau where uh, the upper, the, the soup bound and the inf bound don't change as you kind of move a pencil across the function. And as a result, the, because your soup bound is staying the same, your inf bound is staying the same, halfway between them is staying the same, which means your function value stays the same, and you get these flat areas. So this is kind of like a boring way, but I actually have a, a nice demonstration of this. So this is what, if you have, if you hand it like a, a demonstration scoring problem with a bunch of labeled points, um, what you end up getting looks like a series of like, almost like a Mario level or something, like a platform thing, where you get these very steep jumps in between these like rather large flat areas. Um, so, all right, can we smooth this out? And uh, the answer is yes. So we're gonna stop using Lipschitz continuity um, because it's like a math thing and we're applied math people. Uh, and we're just gonna project these minimal cones from each point. What do I mean by minimal cones? I'll just show you a picture, right? This is the uh, Belyukov uh, Lipschitz cones and those are minimal cones. So essentially like every function value falls in between those cones. And so the nice thing you see is that, uh, right, unlike the uh, monotone Lipschitz cones, they're, they're not really flat ever unless they have to be, uh, which means that the function's never flat. And indeed, if you run it on a similar example, you get a much smoother uh, interpolating surface, which is uh, pretty elegant. So this is what high score does. This is the high score technique. Um, so it's a modification of the Belyakov technique to be more usable in practice. And one of the nice things here is that um, pretty much everywhere in this function, if you move uh, up uh, in the score increasing direction, you actually will see an increase in score. It's, it's very, very disinclined from ever being flat, which is again very important uh, if you go back to the original theory of what scores are because it, uh, it provides validity and external validation to the fact that your score is working. Because hey, I just increased a good thing and now my score went up, as opposed to I increased a good thing and my score stayed exactly the same. Uh, so I'm gonna give an example of how you can use high score uh, and it's gonna be a simplified uh, water well score um, where is this here? So the World Health, so this is a water well in Tanzania. I was actually um, informed of this example. I gave a talk on a very early version of this work at IBM Research Africa uh, in Nairobi. And uh, at the end of the talk, people were like, can we use this to like score traffic intersections in Nairobi? Can we use this to score water wells in Tanzania? And I was like, cool, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is like what a water well in Tanzania looks like. So. It's a, it's a certain distance from structures and it has a certain platform size. And uh, there's actually a World Health Organization uh, metric, which is just 10 yes or no questions about um, the water well. So it asks questions like, is there a ditch or pond within 10 meters of the well? Um, and you want a no answer, not a yes answer. Um, so the risk of contamination in the water wells increases with the number of these yes answers. So this is a kind of an existing scoring system. And for this example, I'll just use a very simplified version, which only has two factors, but we're gonna use uh, numeric factors instead of binary factors. So we'll just say um, distance from the nearest latrine and platform size. So the first thing we need to do if we're using supervised scoring is we have to label a reference set. Uh, and what I found is, is that one of the quickest ways to get the sort of nonlinear responses you want out of your system is to just take a high, middle, and low value in each dimension. So uh, for distance from latrine, we'll say a low value is zero meters, a medium value is 10 meters, that's the value that the WHO uses, and then 50 meters is a large distance. And then for platform size, we'll use like one square foot, right, 25 square feet, five by five, and 100 square feet, 10 by 10, where again, 25 square feet is what the WHO uses as the binary threshold. 
So uh, I, being an expert in water wells, uh, scored this reference set um, and labeled the monotone relationship as increasing in both dimensions, right? We want the score to go up the further from latrine you are, we want the score to go up uh, as your platform size increases. Uh, and this is as close as I'm gonna come to actually doing a live demo of high score. Um, we can, in Python, we can just import high score, we can set the reference set, which is gonna be uh, a dict mapping tuples to numeric values. Uh, we set the monotone relationship vector, and then we just call high score create on the reference set, and as additional information, we can tell it uh, the minimum value we ever wanted to send out and the maximum value we ever wanted to send out. Uh, and what you get uh, when you calculate values using the object that's created by this call uh, is this cool nonlinear 3D plot. Uh, and you, know, you could verify that this actually does interpolate through the points that you handed it, and it obeys the monotone relationship. And another thing is it kind of picks up on some of the nonlinearities that you expressed in the reference set scoring. So essentially, you know, that, that you're valuing distance from latrine uh, more than size of the, of the water well. So you can kind of see that reflected in the score. It's a little bit, it's hard because it's three dimensions. But um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the output of this function. It's this uh, kind of elegant uh, nonlinear function. So we can also make this model more complex. Like, okay, there are things you want to score that aren't just two dimensions. So what if we wanted to add more dimensions? Um, so one way to do that would just be to go ahead and add dimensions. But a clever way of doing it is to avoid the curse of dimensionality by building a tree. So say I wanted to add um, distance to other pollutants that aren't latrines, and then I wanted to add a feature to say, is my platform damaged or not? So instead of having a single score with these four inputs, I can actually do uh, three different scores with two inputs, where um, uh, the location score here and the platform score are subscores. And then the overall water well score is actually a high score object created from the output of other high score objects. So in this way, we're only labeling, instead of labeling, you know, whatever uh, three to the four uh, values, we only have to label uh, three squared values three times. Um, but the, the nice thing is that this can then scale, you know, this is obviously a toy example, um, but using this uh, tree and subscore method, you can build and more importantly understand by looking at the subscores as uh, the values percolate up a tree, uh, scores with dozens of input dimensions. So um, one of the companies that I work with uh, is Independent Energy Standards and they do this for fracking wells and their score has dozens of dimensions that gauge you know, how safe this fracking well is. Um, so that's, and they're using this tree-based method to express that score. And um, frankly, it's very difficult to even kind of think about scores that have 70 dimensions, right? You can't put 70 dimensions in your head. Um, I had a professor at CMU that claimed he, the most dimensions he could visualize was 10. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very difficult to actually get a sense of what's happening with 70 input dimensions, but I would suggest that a combination of high score, which uh, guarantees these nice monotonicity properties, uh, plus, you know, this tree structure actually gives you the ability to more or less make sense out of a score with 70 input dimensions, which frankly is a lot better than what Cloud did. Okay, uh, and just in closing, um, you might suggest like one of the obvious kind of complaints about a technique like this is, well, what if my inputs aren't monotone? Um, you know, what if, you know, I want a middle value and the middle value is the best, not a low value or a high value? So uh, an illustration of this is blood pressure. So. Uh, there are two numbers that come up in blood pressure, systolic and diastolic. Um, systolic is your uh, blood pressure where your heart is beating, and the other is where your heart's at rest. Um, and there's this normal range that's good. Uh, if you're above the normal range, that's bad. And then if you kind of have low blood pressure, that's not better. It's like kind of bad. Um, ideally, you'd have some way of expressing this in high score. So this would be, right, these are two uh, non-monotone input dimensions. Okay, can we use high score this? And, and the answer is yes. Um, we can convert this problem from two non-monotone dimensions into four monotone dimensions, right? Uh, so we uh, change a single value of systolic blood pressure into a like a systolic plus and a systolic minus, and we let uh, the function be decreasing in both of these values, and we set one of these values to zero depending on which side 
of the, uh, you know, if you have high or low blood pressure. Um, and so in this way, we've turned a, a problem with two non-monotone dimensions into four uh, monotone dimensions, and then we could use high score to uh, produce a really good score on this because you know you can see it's going to be non-linear. We want to pick up that kind of these uh, diastolic minus and systolic minus variables are not as bad as their plus equivalents, um, and high score could pick that up uh, based on labeling the reference set. So. Uh, this is available, it's open source, it's my first uh, open source package. I was, I was joking earlier that uh, this is a lot better code than I normally write. Um, I've never actually released an open source package. It's a little bit like walking around, like, you know, like going outside naked. So I definitely like uh, put a lot more effort into the code. It has like tests and like really good comments and stuff, which is not normal. I get a lot of feedback from people I sent the initial release to, and they're like, did you write this code? This looks a lot better than the code you write. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's on, I don't know actually the, the Python package index. I don't want to say PyPy because that means something else. Um, but you can install it with pip. You just do pip install high score and it will install uh, on your computer so you can mess around with it. Um, so whatever you want to score, it is out there. So go get to it. Uh, thank you very much, guys.